listening to Best Forevers, a podcast for kindred spirits. I'm Elisa Lucas, and I'm just back from my friendship trip with Tara to Paris and Prague. I've got myself a sweet sinus infection, so please note how sexy my voice is right now. Yeah, I'm also really excited to get right back into the podcast game. I had recorded all three of my last episodes before I went to Paris, and so this is the first time in several weeks that I'm recording. Ferguson is less than an inch away from me, um, so all is right in the world. In this week's episode, I chat with friends Isabel and Kate about their friendship, which started in an online pregnancy group and has included many experiences that others would likely retreat from for whatever reasons they might be. But here they are, Kate and Isabel, together after so many years of distance and the last couple years face to face, about to experience a military move. But they're each other's exceptions that I wouldn't do that for anyone but Isabel or Kate kind of friends. I'm especially pleased to have witnessed this friendship, especially given that many of us are probably not equipped to be friends with people experiencing a whole lot of, frankly, what you might call shit. What you'll hear is an extremely open and frank discussion of friendships. Kate jokes about having zero boundaries and all about protecting Isabel's boundaries, which makes me love their friendship even more because they just get each other. Many of you will be familiar with Kate, who is the thoughtful, no-holds-barred host of the wonderfully produced and important podcast, Ignorance Was Bliss, and her lovely, lovely, lovely friend, Isabel. What you can expect is a discussion of trauma, illness, and other topics that clearly do not get enough attention, so be prepared, but also be open to consider how these topics and others need the light shed on them so, so badly. Here is Kate and Isabel. Well, thank you so much, Kate and Isabel, for being on Best Forevers. I can't wait to hear about your friendship. Can you start with your origin story? How did the two of you meet? Um, We met, was it 14 years ago now? Almost 15, I think. Oh, my goodness. Online. It was a pregnancy board, and we were pregnant, you know, at the same time, obviously, and due the same month. Wow. And, uh, I mean, at, at the time, I don't think we had a lot of interaction, but... We kept in touch a little bit and we became Facebook friends and, um, you know, over the years, maybe a few words here and there, but that was it. And then I moved here from South Carolina and I knew Kate was here. And so I sent her a message and I say, hey, can we meet? (laughs) And that was the beginning of it. Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, my when I was pregnant with my now almost 14 year old. Wow. Um. I got put on bed rest, and this is back in the days of dial-in internet <laughs> and iVillage. Yeah, back then, and I just needed something to do. You know, I was home with a four-year-old and on bed rest, and I really wanted not to kill my own child, and so I got online. And you know, anytime you get a group of women together, you get those who are prone to drama and you get those who are prone to stand back and watch the drama. <laughs> and Isabel and I were both in that latter group. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, iVillage eventually dissolved. And I took a long time to join Facebook oh, wow. after that. I mean, I, iVillage dissolved, I don't remember what year it was, 2006 or seven, something like mm-hmm. that. And I didn't join Facebook until like 2009. And then when I did, I don't even know why. We must have exchanged emails or something at some point or we had friends in common or something because I didn't – I don't recall going to look for Isabel specifically, but I didn't recall going to look for anybody. Yeah. Yeah, I think I sent you a friend request because uh, you know how it shows up when you have friends in common. Mm -hmm. You probably showed up and I sent you. Something like that. And so we would chat. I would see her posts. um, Isabel is French. And so once in a while she would post in French and I – took French you know (laughs) I had been to Paris and so you know being that sort of smug American I was like oh boy I could read her posts like that's some sort of accomplishment (laughs) um but so she stayed on my radar and then I got sick oh and I don't entirely know the details behind what happened when I was sick but so in 2010 I had my 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 third biological child Mm -hmm. and Things went south, and I'm just going to refer people to, I don't know the number, but people are wild. Mm -hmm. 
and I can send you the link for your show notes if you want. But I, I just spoke with Kim in detail okay, yeah. about what happened. So I'm not going to bog this episode down with that because that is a very sad and scary story. Gotcha. Yeah. But I, the moral is I was in the hospital for six weeks. Um, I did have internet access eventually after, say, the fourth week. But in the meantime, I have no idea what went on on Facebook. I, my, my close friend Gretchen, um, I had given her my, my Facebook login information so that she could post birth pictures and, you know, that sort of Mm -hmm. expectation of happy news. There you go. And that's not what happened. Yeah. Um, and I've seen her posts from then, um, March, 2010. And my son was born on the fifth. And so you can see like, Oh boy, Oh boy, here's pregnancy pictures. And then, Stuff gets hard, yeah. but I don't know what happened while I was sort of out because you, you were there for that. Yeah, I, you know, I watched it all happen on Facebook and it was really scary. Mm. Felt so powerless, you know, not being able to help or do anything. And what, what happened with the birds thing? Oh, yeah. So I don't remember who it was, but one of your friends asked all of us, I guess it was all of us who were um, in the I village group to make a bird so that she would be able to assemble them in a sort of garland. Yeah. And somebody and, did. Yeah. yeah I didn't not, when you say you. she, it wasn't me yeah. that assembled I, them. I remember I lived in Seattle when, when I sent it and uh yeah, it was blue and white. I think I saw it on your garland. Let me have you sure it's up there. It's <laughs> it's it's I still have it hanging upstairs. They yeah. made this garland of, of everybody made a bird. Yeah. And I don't know why birds exactly. Um I don't remember. Why not? I mean, it could be as simple as opening the dictionary and there you go, it's a bird. I, it probably had some sort of deeper meaning, but I have very sketchy memory from that time in my life. And so now Isabel's, you know, sort of bigger on my radar screen mm-hmm. because it's, I mean, maybe a dozen people contributed, something like that. Um, and I have... I have no memory from the year prior wow. to when things went bad. And so I'm trying to reconstruct yeah. a sense of memory and a sense of who my friends are and a sense of who I am. I mean, when I was, I was in a coma for 10 days and oh when I woke God. up um, on the wall next to my bed, there was this, you know how in like preschool you do an all about me yeah. poster? Yeah, yeah. You know, here's my favorite music, and here's my favorite color, and my family is blah blah. Well, they, my my husband and kids, my my two older kids, had done that right. because at the time my oldest was ten and my my next was five, and now I got a newborn. And that the reason they had done it was both as sort of a something to do for them to feel useful, yeah. and as a reminder to the staff that this is not just a lump in the bed that this is a person who has a family and personality and stuff like that. And, you know, it's a nice thing that they do. Uh, this is, I was in mass general hospital and I used to lay in my bed and study that to learn it because I didn't know what my favorite music was. I didn't know who I lived with anymore. I had forgotten all that. Um, I woke, I didn't know how to write any like physically handwrite. Um, I couldn't walk again. I, I had to learn a lot of stuff. Wow. And so it was the same concept of I don't know who my friends are. I had to learn. And one thing that helped is that, you know, the rule in most um, ICUs, I was in a, it's called the SICU, Surgical Intensive Care Unit, is that only immediate relatives are allowed in. And I had my parents and my husband – my kids were too young. Mm-hmm. And then they would joke about how precocious my parents were because five or six of my close friends here <laughs> came and would sit at my bedside. And so they were all sisters, you know, and one of them was like two years younger than my parents. So, you know, yeah. good for them. <laughs> and so I love it, though. It's like you got to get the friends in there. Well, you know, exactly. And, you know, and then people from out of town were calling. And these are all women like I, I'm not... Uh, I'm close to all of them in the sense that if something happened, they would be here, but they all live just far enough away that, I, you know, we don't get together very much anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and once 
my health gets better, they're going to go back to their own lives. You know, yeah. I, there's no bitterness here. It's just that's how, how it is. So th the moral is there were people also who did not come to my bedside because they couldn't because they lived far away. You know, Seattle to Boston is kind of a <laughs> long trek. Yes. <laughs> um, but then, what, three years ago? Two years ago. Two years ago. Um, Isabel's husband is in the uh, in the service, and he was transferred mm -hmm. to Boston. And so she's like, oh, let's get together. And I was like, oh, yeah, cool. You know, my I have kind of an open-door policy at my house because we live in Salem, Massachusetts, yeah. and so a lot of people come here mm -hmm. to travel, you know, to tourists. And in retrospect, I understood – because we, we get a lot of – of visitors, and so I kind of take it for granted. But in retrospect, I think about you know the sheer cojones it took for Isabel to come here. She brought both of her daughters mm -hmm. and came to my home. We didn't meet in a public place first, you know, and hung out uh, for a day. And to me, it seemed like a fairly straightforward. Here's what happens, you know, because it's happened before. I'm sure it'll happen again. It's not like. Every other day I've got somebody here, but probably I'd say once a year mm -hmm. I get somebody from out of town who's never been here. But now I think about, you know, a woman alone, her husband's at sea, you know, and, and she comes with her kids. You know, she doesn't know if I'm a big, hairy, sweaty guy who's been making this up for 15 years. I might still be. She doesn't know. <laughs> Let's hope not. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a little scary, but um, I don't know. I've been... I've. I felt like I knew you, you know? I mean, we did, in a way. Yeah. Just not in the in-person way. And, yeah, I mean, if you know somebody at the time for, like, what, 12 years, you, there's kind of a sense of, like, all right, you know, nobody's going to... Basically, if you really are going to maintain that, that pretense for 12 years, <laughs> come on in. Yeah. You know, come on in for dinner. You deserve that no matter what. Congratulations. <laughs> The long con. <laughs> <laughs> right? Here's some spaghetti, you know? And we just we just clicked. That's awesome. Yeah, we did. And so the last two years then have been face-to-face. -face. Yeah, we get together. It depends on the, it depends on the time. You know, we kind of have had different phases based on health, based on family circumstances, based on whatever. But... I don't think we've gone a span of more than, what, a month, oh, yeah, I would say, sure. yeah. of getting together um, in some form, in some capacity. Um, she lives about, what, 45 minutes away. Yeah. And either I drive there or she comes up here. Um, but, I mean, there was a span of time right after she moved here where we were getting together every week because my health was finally getting better. You know, and this is – so I, I, I have – messed up stuff happened to me and I was not a sickly kid yeah and I was not a sickly adult you know I had been healthy yeah I, I was diagnosed with an auto, autoimmune disorder at age 27 and then it was I was 32 when stuff got real bad with after the birth of my third and you know but otherwise until that moment nobody expected me to get sick yeah you know, but it took me, it was, I, I was on visiting nurse care in 2010 for nine months. And you're only on visiting nurse care if they believe you cannot leave the house. Yeah. Wow. And so that was big, bad stuff. And then I would start to get better. And like I had gone back to work and then I thought I had a cold and I eventually I went to the ER because the cough was so bad and it was a weekend and it turns out, no, 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 you have an abscess on your lung. Oh my gosh. How does that happen? Well, we don't know. You know? And then a couple of years later, it was, I, I due to the autoimmune disorder, I stepped wrong and I broke my back. Oh, my gosh. On a playground. And so that was 2014. And now I'm on disability because of it. And then 2016, I was diagnosed with epilepsy. You know? And so it's just sort of one thing after another. So when Isabel and I met... I couldn't drive because the, the, the law is in Massachusetts, no driving for six months mm -hmm. after a seizure. And, um, you know, after an, a, a, an unwitnessed, undiagnosed, previously undiagnosed seizure. And so I was, was grounded 
And so she actually dro- uh, drove me to get a tattoo. That was that's right. <laughs> um, that was oh, that's fun. That's right. That was not very long after we met. Yeah, because we were yeah. supposed to meet in March, and right around then is when I had the seizure. Oh. And I mean, it was a big bad thing. It was I was in what they call status epilepticus, which means sustained seizure for four hours. Wow. Um, I don't recommend it. You know, as sexy <laughs> as I might make not. it look, it was it was not actually that fun. <laughs> and um, and so I was not allowed to drive until like until September. And I had had to put Isabel off because I had a real bad reaction to the first medication they put me on. Um, and I was not up to seeing anybody for a while. And um, so she came in May instead. And then by August, she's driving to sit with me while I got a tattoo. <laughs> so that was pretty cool because that's a big – I had to go two times mm-hmm. to get it done. I couldn't do it in one sitting. What's the tattoo of? I have to send you photos. Yes. But basically, um, so after I got sick and then I, I, it's been, it was a long recovery process and I got so tired of being the one who got sick, Yeah. you know, oh, that was you. And I was having a hard time wrapping my brain around all of it, all, you know, just sort of grieving and letting go. And I finally, I wrote a letter to all my friends and family, basically, saying, I want you to write one word, handwrite, one word that reminds you of my recovery, not of my illness. Yeah. And then I had my kid, uh, who was by then 13 or 14, um, I guess no 16, because this is 2016 that it happened, that we finally got got the tattoo. I had my kid get into forgery (laughs) uh, and uh, take all of those words and put them together, not like in a word cloud, but in a long, thin line, you know? Yeah. And that wraps around my ankle oh, that's probably cool. five times or something. That's amazing. And it's all the people's words and the color that they chose, you know? And that's why it took so long is because it's probably three or four feet long total. Wow. <laughs> and um, and so she said, so, you know, and so Isabel's word is in French. Uh. Which makes it better. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <clears throat> and um, and so, yeah, it was just, I think that was a good bonding thing. Mm-hmm. We went to Rhinebeck, yeah, which, that was fun. Um, I don't know if you knit. Uh, I have before. Isabel and I are knitters, yes. you know, sort of inveterate knitters. And, you know, when I found out she knitted that first night, I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> it's meant to be. <laughs> and... You know, immediately we started making plans because Rhinebeck is, it's in New York and it is the biggest sheep and wool festival, which that's a thing. It's a thing. (laughs) And biggest sheep and wool festival in the country once a year, every October. And we rented an Airbnb house, which was amazing. And a couple other people joined us and it was just this really great getaway. It was awesome. So is that a French trip that you've taken more than once? Oh, no. We've only been once. No? No, we've only gone one time. We keep meaning to, and then something gets in the way. Yeah. Yeah. Darn life. But you had gone before, just not with me. Yeah, I'd been once or twice before, but I had not gone since I got sick. Yeah. You know, sort of a, a, a celebration, again, of even though it's six years later, I'm still just barely getting on my feet. Yeah. So what would you say, you know, you said you met online uh, in the pregnancy group. I think that is amazing that people can make these connections online and that when Isabel, you know, moved to Boston to be able to make connections, was there something that would you would say that drew you together online? And then separately, is there something that you think drew you together offline, face to face? I don't remember online well enough. No, uh, I mean, I kind of remember. I just, I know that we didn't have a lot of interaction, but I I read your blog all the time, you know, and so I felt, like I said, I felt like I knew you, but we never really had a lot of interaction at all. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a ton. It was just sort of somebody I was aware of on Facebook. Yeah, and I did. I had a blog that I I kind of continued after I got sick, but not very much. Um. But so the blog was just sort of a conversational, like a mommy blog, except I swore more <laughs> than average. And uh, 
And over time, I mean, I went dark, I think, for a long time after I got sick. I didn't, I didn't post much. And, you know, I let my blog lapse and it never really picked it up again. Um, because I realized that when you're, when you're sick, when you're recovering, um, people, you can't keep posting negative stuff. Yeah. Because you start to sound like you're either whining or complaining. Mm -hmm. And people just can't cope with that. And so I went, I had gone dark. I had stopped posting anyway. And then as I start, you know, I would watch Facebook or, or as I started posting again, it was, it was really interesting to see who's still left, who's still around versus who has gone away. Yeah. You learn a lot about who your friends are when you get sick. Oh, yeah. That's what I was going to ask, like, you know, it seems that when those things happen that for some people it's, uh, they don't, it's like they don't know what to do, um, or that it becomes too much for them. And it's like they, um, I was talking about this with, uh, my friend Amanda, we just did an interview about, uh, friendship and mommyhood that when moms have babies, sometimes they retreat or sometimes their friends who don't have children retreat because it's like they don't know what to do. And so what would you say? I mean, I know you said that for an entire year is like relearning and figuring out who your friends were. But were there friends? Uh, I mean, I imagine Isabel, since she's here. Hi. Hi. <laughs> were there other things that you noticed about the friends who stuck around? Like what... Are there certain qualities that you saw in these friends that, um, cause you said you learn a lot about who your friends are, but what do you learn about the friends who stayed? I don't know how to word it, except they were able to cope with negativity mm -hmm. better. You know, I mean, absolutely. There are, there are friends who evaporate when you have kids and they don't. And that was one upside for Isabel and I having babies at the same time, you know, is that we were able to kind of go through that and commiserate <laughs> because kids are a pain in the ass and they ruin everything. They really do. <laughs> I, I don't know why anybody has kids. I have four and I don't know why anybody has kids. <laughs> but um, so there was that, you know, we were able to sort of understand that like I might be bitching one day, but that's not to say I regret having kids. Yeah. It's just some days are hard. Parenting is the hardest thing I've ever done. Yeah. Um, it's the most important thing I've ever done. And so it kind of should be hard. But at the same time, it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So there's that. But I think just, and you have to decide how, you know, you can always ask somebody to cut stuff out or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think that the friends that stuck around have had issues of anxiety or issues of depression and know what it means to struggle. Yeah. And that's what allows them to cope better. Mm hmm with my challenges. I mean, because I, I, I experienced anxiety and depression a whole lot since I was young. I had a traumatic experience when I was 12, which is now on the fallout files. So, you know, I've kind of spread out there. I'm on, I'm, I'm everywhere. <laughs> I'm wicked cool. <laughs> but uh, but I, I did just speak uh, episode three of the fallout files mm -hmm. um, about the trauma that I experienced, although people need to be very careful about looking that one up because that's ex there's there's triggers left right and center gotcha. there yep. um but so since then i know what it means to to struggle with you know and and, and i'm not remotely suggesting that isabel has the same you know tr childhood trauma kind of deal but if you know i've had ch i've had problems difficulties with that with the ideas of depression and, and anxiety since I was 12. And Isabel certainly knows uh, what it is like to bounce back from some stuff. Um, again, you can decide whether no, we leave it in or out. But right. yeah. Isabel is the voice in my first episode. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she so she has experienced an abusive relationship that she came back from. Yeah. And I think that the other people that stuck around for their own reasons, each different, of course, but they know what it means to, to bounce back. Whereas some of the people who, who faded out of my life, I think some were still dealing with their own demons so intensely yeah. that they couldn't help me deal with mine. And others 
really didn't know what I was going through. Like there really was this sense of like, why aren't you better yet? Yeah. You should be better. You know, this shouldn't hurt you like this anymore. And I'm like, "Uh uh-huh. Thanks. You know? (laughs) And so, like I said, I mean, I never really looked, thought about it. I am, this is me just yeah. you know, spouting off now the first time I'm really thinking about it, well, about what, what the similarities are between those who faded away and those who stayed. But I think that's, that's a big one. Well, no, I think that what you're saying is that friends you know, might retreat for different reasons, right? Um, or they might stay for different reasons. And I think that is sort of the point you're making. And and you said this was the first time you thought about it, so it's you talking. This is also, you know, questions that I'm just thinking of as we talk as well, right? You know, and so one of the things that I think of is, oh gosh, how do I, I'm trying to think of how to word this, but certainly um, if I didn't say this at the beginning, I'll, you know, this can be edited out, but anything that you're not comfortable talking about or answering, feel free Um you know, not to, to, you don't have to answer anything you don't want. Right. Um, Isn't that cute? She thinks I have boundaries. Yeah. <laughs> I, have, I have no boundaries. I'm just <laughs> yeah. trying to protect yeah. Isabel. <laughs> but I also, you know, I want to respect whatever boundaries you might have if they're wide or, or, or very small. But one of the things I wonder as, as we're, as we're talking is in our world, um, you know, people experience trauma and they experience different types of relationships and other experiences. And I just wonder, and again, this is sort of off the top of my head. I just wonder if our world, our society doesn't really set up friends, like friends are supposed to be there, right? Where there are certain qualities like being there for me, it, it's an enjoyable relationship, it's voluntary, but there's no judgment and social support and, and, you know, all that kind of good stuff. And there's sort of this positive vibe to friendship. And I think that friendship brings so many positive things to our life. But at the same time, I also think that we might be at a disadvantage because we don't integrate friends very well, say like in media or talking about in society into how to help or how to be there, or how to be a friend when people are experiencing a trauma. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, how, that's you more than me. Like, how did you know to stick around? Well, uh, there was a connection, definitely. I liked you a lot. I, you know, I think you're funny. I just love talking with you and being around you. And that happened right away. So I just never really put a lot of thought about it. I just really enjoyed your company. And... Uh, uh, it is really hard for me to make friends because I move every couple of years yeah. to a complete different part of the country. And so it's hard for me to make friends and um, get attached because I know I'm going to have to say goodbye. Mm. Um, but, you know, sometimes there's just relationships that stick and, you know, it's forever. <laughs> and I, I knew that I knew, you know, right from the start. That's that's one of the things that we talk about on the podcast is that sometimes it's hard to determine what people's origin story is or what it was. It's just you knew that there's this level of we're kindred spirits <laughs> and we're going to be mm-hmm. together forever no matter no matter what. And so, you know, as well you talked about moving a lot and so I imagine you said it's really hard to make friends. What are some of the things that that you do to either make friends or you said, you know, you don't want to get too attached. How do you, how do you navigate friendships when you have to move so much? Uh, the sad truth is that I make very, very few friends. Uh, I'm not a very outgoing person and I'm kind of shy. Uh, so, um, I just don't spend a lot of time, you know, trying to make friends. Um, uh, there's some people I know that I've met, you know, on base where I live, um, we're friendly, but very, very few people in the past 15 years have become actual friends. Um, I, I, yeah, I think I can count, like I probably have less than five real friends, you know. Uh, it's, it's sad, but it's, it's my life, you know. Um, until my husband gets out of the military, we're, we're going to have to deal with that. And I'm sad for my kids because they also... yeah. You know, they make friends and then they say goodbye. It's just a never-ending cycle. So I, I, the truth is I don't make friends. Yeah. I, I have 
very, very few friends. It's sad. But I imagine, would you agree that the ones that you have are high quality? So those five people are... Yes. And so sometimes it's, uh, you know, I, I haven't moved around a lot. In fact, I lived in Pennsylvania for about 10 or so years, but otherwise I've been in Michigan about an hour from where I grew up my entire life, either where I grew up, but I see students, I'm a college professor and I see students every year graduate and, and move away or people transfer and that sort of thing. And, you know, I had friends who moved away and I can imagine that is very difficult that you might learn some strategies in which to have acquaintances at the time in the places that you're in and that you have sort of a, you know, a network, but it's not those close relationships, but that really it is the quality perhaps over quantity, even though you might wish for more friends that, I mean, five quality friendships, that's to me, I'm like, that's amazing. But I also know that it must be very difficult to manage those five quality friendships um, when you do have to move. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, I meet a lot of people and there's a lot of people I like, but people that I would actually, you know, be close friends with and that I could talk about anything and you know those are very few so I do know people yeah. um, but I don't open up to them like I did you know with Kate mm -hmm. um, yeah I mean the military culture everybody moves yes yeah uh, you know everybody expects moving everybody expects you to go away and so you know there's that I think there's an ability to form what looks like a bond yeah but really it's it's not, you know, it's it's built with the expectation that this is going to have to be split up sometime very soon. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're lucky, you're in the same placement with somebody else for three years. Yeah. You know, and mm -hmm. that's that's a blink of an eye. And so I think that everybody becomes trans. You learn how to assess people really quickly. You learn how to cut out some of the BS that a lot of people live through mm -hmm. and you learn how to move, you, to let go very quickly because you have to. Yeah. yeah. And, and there were a few friends that I thought I was going to be friends forever. And soon after I moved away, you know, our relationship kind of, uh, you know, we at first we called, we texted and everything and little by little we did it less and less. And now I'm barely in contact with those people at all. But they were really good friends when I lived there. And you, yeah. Well, and she just went through sort of the breakup of a friendship mm. that was difficult. Well, I, I don't want to... You know, and, no, I, I'm not su suggesting details at all because that's a, someone that may very well be still interested. And it's just a case of some distance didn't, it didn't hold over distance. Yeah. And yeah. that's a hard thing as well. Yeah. You know, any breakup of a friendship, I think that, you know, I mean, I, I lost my what I would consider one of my very best friends in 2011, yeah. who, somebody who was in the room when I gave birth in 2010, you know, one, one of the people who was at my bedside in the ICU. And a year later, she suddenly had terrible accusations to me, which she never gave me any chance to respond to um, or prove that she was wrong or anything. It was just, bang, here's what I think is happening, and we're done forever. Wow. And... I don't think, I certainly don't think, you know, if the media doesn't give enough attention to friendship, it certainly does not give enough attention to how hard it is to end a friendship. Exactly. How, you know, that breakup in, in many ways is, is worse than the breakup of a romantic relationship, I think. I completely agree with that. I think that there isn't enough uh, academic research on it to see if the breakups uh, follow similar patterns to romantic relationships or if there's something different about it. It's something that I try to talk about in the classroom and have students apply and talk about their experiences. But uh, yeah, I would say that friendship breakups, one of the things is we, we choose our friends. We choose to spend time. We choose to stick around. We choose to be there through all these things. And then when something goes wrong and it ends, it, it I, I have friendship breakups that have been uh, more devastating than romantic breakups. And we certainly don't talk about it. I'm hoping to do an entire episode on that topic because I think it's really important to um, our understanding of friendship and relationships, but also coping and, and communication, self-care, so many different concerns. And so I'm glad you said something about it because, yeah, first, friendship is not in the forefront, but then thinking about the problems that friendships go through or how they might end, 
is not discussed at all. And so it's almost like people, we might not know how to, to end a friendship or when it does end, how to deal with it. So it's very devastating. Well, what I would point out is that for, you know, obviously for one, call me when you get there yeah. <laughs> because I have things to say. Yes, of for course. Sure. <laughs> but what I would point out is that both Isabel and I are sitting here right now going, I don't want to talk about that. I don't know how to talk about that. I'm not comfortable talking about that. Yeah. Meanwhile, Isabel was on my first episode talking about a romantic thing that went south with no problem. Yeah. That's funny. I didn't think of that. <laughs> you know, and I would, I could, I could list off romantic breakups that were just like, all right, sit down and listen to this one. But I can't, I still struggle and I don't know why. But I still struggle with talking about the loss of this other friendship I had. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because I don't have a, a framework for it. Yeah. Well, and one of the things is there's sort of in research, there's a there's a guy, his name is Steve Duck, and he has these five phases of relationship dissolution. And it primarily focuses on romantic relationships. And it's one of those things that we see in the media all the time where people talk about it. You know, most people have gone through a romantic breakup. They've either been dumped or they've been the dumpy or they've had something ended, whether it be a, a mutual agreement or something that they didn't want to end. And so I think we have much more of a script to follow for for breakups. And I think that with friendship that, gosh, is there just more layers? Is there more complication? Is there more care? Is there more... You know, it just makes me wonder. There's something different about it. For sure. I mean, because we have a phrase, right? BFF, yeah. right? Forever. We we assume that. And my, my response to that would be, why? I don't understand why we think friendships to last forever yeah. any more than anything else. Like everything has a lifespan. Yeah. You know, there are classes everywhere you go. Almost every college, every college that I know of, everywhere I've ever taught has had, you know, lifespan development yeah. courses, you know, available and part of that is you know looking at the end phases yeah and whether you are talking about a human being or an animal or a business or a tree or a relationship everything has a lifespan yeah you know and and not everything lasts forever and that's that's okay like it doesn't make the friendship it doesn't invalidate it yeah. somehow like Oh, well, that was wasted years. That was wasted time. It was just that was what I needed then. Exactly. In romantic relationships, I think it's easier to get to the point where you say, well, you know, that sucks that, that it didn't work out, but it was what I needed it to be when I needed it to be that thing. And so I'm, I'm going to accept that and we're going to move on. You know, that that doesn't invalidate the whole relationship just because it ended. But with friendships, I think we struggle more with that. And I don't know why. I wonder if, you know, for one of the things is, you know, we have things called like commemorative friendships. They might not have like we're not physically together, but we still think fondly about those people. Like my friend Noelle moved when I was a little kid and I've never heard or seen from her again, but I still think of her fondly. Right. That it is something that she is someone who will always be something, someone who's a part of me. And I also think about you know, one of my best friends was killed in a car accident the summer before my senior year in high school and spent, that was in 95. So it's been a very long time, but she is someone who I always is, it doesn't matter if we're together or not, that she is my friend forever. And so I, I wonder if there's just something about, you know, we carry friendship with us wherever we go, whereas with a romantic relationship, we might be, okay, well, that one didn't work out. Who am I dating next? Whereas you might not go, all right, which one of you is going to be my friend next, right? You know, <laughs> that, you know, we have this whole dating scene or this, that, or the other thing. We don't necessarily have that for friendship. And I wonder if that's, I don't know, I'm talking off the top of my head here. <laughs> no, there's something, there's something to it. And also, I think in a lot of times, in you know, romantic relationships, Obviously, there's that, there's that thing of, like, after you break up, who gets the friends? Yes. Right? Yes. That, you know, any, like, sort of mutual friends you have, you kind of have to farm them out, whatever. But you don't lose them. Yeah. You don't expect to necessarily lose everybody. And, you know, one person gets the house 
or you you can still you know it's hard it hurts to maybe go back to a restaurant you used to eat at or whatever but you you still have it and you know if your kids go to the same school as they are you don't tell your kids for the most part you don't tell your kids like don't talk to those kids anymore yeah. but with the friendship that i lost for instance i had a, a, by the time it fell apart, I had three kids. She had three kids, and they were all about the same age. Mm -hmm. And my husband got along with her husband. And so there were so many interconnecting relationships that were just cut off. Yeah. Just bang. That if she and I were not friends, then none of those people could be friends. And so everybody around me struggled. There was a mutual friend between us that she literally told her or me. Wow. You know, which, are we 12? Seriously? That's tough. And so, I mean, that made the decision very easy because the mutual friend was like, I don't want to be friends with a 12-year-old. <laughs> you know? And so she and I are still friends. But Sorry. <laughs> she and I, the one that you know chose me over her, were not as close. Yeah. And I think it's because there's this hole in our triangle. Yeah. You know, suddenly we're an open, you know, it's not a closed polygon anymore it's an open thing and we don't fully know how to negotiate a, a two-person friendship yeah. in the way that we had with three and so it's it's just there's a there's something you know missing or wrong yeah I mean when we get together we're we're perfectly happy to get together but there's something not right so I, absolutely it's it's tough but the thing about the military then is that for the most part they walk in knowing yeah I'm going to move away. And when I say move away, I don't mean the next town over. Yeah. You know, and so like they sort of know it. And so the friendships are more fluid. And when you move away, there's sort of an expectation of, well, we might stay in touch. We might not. Yeah. And is this something that you're comfortable talking with? Because, uh, Kate, I think you mentioned that, Isabel, you, you might be moving soon. Oh, yeah. hush. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, we're moving next month. Is that something you like to talk about or no? Yeah, we can talk about it. We can it. talk about it. I don't Like I said, I don't have any boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just, we avoid it because we don't like it. Yeah. yeah. No, but we can talk about it. That's fine. Okay, so <laughs> if you haven't talked about it, which I completely understand that, uh, you know, it's like, avoid to the last moment and then, and the, you know, it's not real until it, it's real. Do you think that, or have you had a conversation about what your friendship will look like after the move? We've already made plans to see each other. You know, we've, we, I know Kate is going to come and visit me at some point, and I'm sure we'll come back here. It might be just twice a year, or it might be more, but we've already made plans, so. That's awesome. Uh, I have no doubt that we'll stay friends. She's, she's moving, it, what, it's about eight hour drive from yeah. here. Because so we live near Boston, yeah. and that means that Isabel being forty five minutes away I means she's right next door, yeah. as far as we're concerned. <laughs> you know, it's just it's just how it is. The two Ma Massachusetts drivers we call them mass holes, mm -hmm. and it's hard to get anywhere. <laughs> but but I'm moving to Buffalo, New York, yeah. and it's a straight shot from here. It's about eight hours, yeah. but it's straight out Route ninety, so it's easy to get there. And my mother lives in Syracuse, New York. Yeah, there you go. So that's only like two hours away. Which means I'm going to have to go visit my mother. <laughs> We're not going to talk about that either. Okay. There's <laughs> <No>. the boundary. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not so much boundaries. My mother's been on my podcast. It's just about my mother makes me crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm not going to anticipate trouble there. Yeah. <laughs> but but um, she knows she makes me crazy. She's kind of proud of the fact, I think. <laughs> you know, it's I don't make friends easily at all. I don't know why. Like, I don't have a reason for it. I'm not shy, as you might have picked yeah. up. I, I just, I think it's partly because I'm so, my, my personality is so strong yeah. that it's hard for people to cope with me, you know? And I don't mean to be. I just get excited, yeah. you know? And, and that's the way it's always been. I think that I'm one of the smart kids, and the smart kids have just have trouble making friends. Mm -hmm. I think other people around me think, oh, you know, the smart kids don't like hanging. They're going to think I'm stupid. I'm not going to talk about, you know, around her because she's going to think I'm stupid. And, you know, I don't give a shit about IQ. Yeah. <laughs> I can talk to anybody about anything. Yeah. You know, and in fact, I prefer to talk to the people who maybe, you know, don't sit so high on this weird IQ curve. Because being that I went and studied for my doctorate, my husband just finished his dissertation, so he's got his doctorate. You know, everybody we know is smart. Yeah. Like wicked smart, as they say in Boston. <laughs> And 
I would like to spend time with people on the other side of the normal curve. Yeah. Because I forget that that, that is a thing, and that's a more normal thing than my experience. And they're so smart. They're just smart in ways that aren't measured by academia. Exactly. You know, but, but they have such an interesting things to say, and they know such fascinating things. And I want to hang out with them. I mean, I okay, you want to pick up somebody fascinating? Talk to Jenna from Meet Me in the Woods. Mm -hmm. Holy shit. Like, she starts so many sentences with a combination of words that I have never used in my <laughs> life. Like, oh, yeah, when I tried to live in Chicago, people got upset because I was eating squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> Say what? <laughs> uh, you know, or, oh, yeah, come on down here. and I'm, I'm packing right now. <laughs> and now me, I'm anti-gun, but I'm like, you are the coolest fucking person I've ever listened to in my yeah. life. <laughs> I could reword that. I don't know if you swear. Oh no! On your, I, no, on there's all sorts of explicit episodes. No worries. <laughs> oh, good. Because she is. I mean, I don't consider us friends yet because I just got to know yeah. her. But she's fascinating, and I don't know where she sits on the IQ curve because I don't care. Yeah. She's smarter than I am. You know what I mean? And so there's that. But I think a lot of people assume like, oh. I'm in academia, you know, yeah. like I, I, I have a, a doctorate, and so I must be wicked smart. And she's not, she's gonna think I'm, I don't know what it is, but the smart kids have trouble making friends, and I do. Yeah. I, I have a hard time making friends, meeting new people. Plus, I'm now, you know, I'm on disability because I broke my back in 2014, so I don't get out in the same yeah. way. I get tired easily, I, I get overwhelmed easily. I developed epilepsy in 2016, and so now I'm frightened to leave the house. Because if I'm going to have a seizure, I want to do it at home. Yeah. And the reality is I've had one seizure since then. Yeah. You know, so I need to get over myself and just do things. But um, prior to Isabel, the last person I let into my life in any way went off the deep end. And I ended up adopting her child. Wow. And I've had no contact with her because I, while I have no problem with sex work as a concept, I do have a problem if you do it with your kids in the room, yeah. for instance. Wow. So, you know, I... I I've gotten bitten a couple of times and I just, where am I going to make friends if I don't leave the house? You know, I'm online. Yeah. I consider people I've met online to be close friends, but it is not the same as getting together in person. Yeah. And, you know, when Isabel moves to Buffalo, there is going to be a hard time, I think, for both of us. I know for me, because somebody who makes me get up and put on pants is not going to be around. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And yes. That's easier to do when you're face to face. <laughs> uh -huh. Right? And so it's hard. I mean, I'm holding on for holding on for a hero. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. I'm holding on for what? You said 5 years you think you'll be in Buffalo? 4 years. 4 years. Yeah. That's not that. I mean, we've already 2 years gone in the blink of an mm -hmm. eye. I mean, I got this tattoo 2 years ago, really? Yeah. No, no, you know what? And so I can do four years. Yeah. You know, my son is about to start high school. So her daughter's about to start high school. And so, frankly, she doesn't need to do deal with a teenage boy. I don't need to deal with another teenage girl for a couple of years. <laughs> so, you know what? Let's skip those years. Yeah. That's fine. That way I'll like her daughter more. She'll <laughs> like my son more. It's better. See a high school graduation. <laughs> oh, God. Exactly. And then you said that Philip wants to settle out here. Well, we love it here. Yeah. And I think both of us would love to be here, you know, when he retires, but... And it's not that expensive on the North Shore. Mm -hmm. You know, housing is a bit expensive, yeah. but it, it, it's not that bad. You know, most of the jobs are, you know, analogous to the housing. Yeah. You know, and he's just been with the military for a billion years, give or take. And so... <laughs> 17 years. He can get a job out here. Yeah. I mean, no, nothing is sure, you know. Of course. I, that's what I want to do. Of course. And I know you And like I too, know people but... who know people in case he changes his mind, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, Sounds like you've thought about it. <laughs> um, no, no, for sure no. <laughs> but so I'm I'm holding on for that. That you know that's whether or not it becomes true. Like I don't think about the future very much. Yeah. Um, honestly, because so many enormous, bizarre things have happened to me. Yeah. I mean, who dies in childbirth in this day and yeah. age? Right. Exactly. And I mean, the statistics on what I went through are about one in four million per year. Oh, my God. Yeah. So cause specifically, it's, it's that about four million births in the U.S., and of those, 100 get sick the way I did. Wow. 
of that hundred, 98 die. One loses all four limbs and one walks away. Oh, my God. So it's even more than that. I just can't cope with statistics very well. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but so, you know, the fact that I walked away from that, I, I was just given birth. Like I was I was happy and healthy, like literally happy and healthy one day. And I was in a coma three days later. Wow. So making plans for the future doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. You know, because every time I start to like physically get better, something weird happens. Yeah. Or every time, if it's not another physical ailment, we've got stuff going on here. And I cannot, because it is not my story to yeah. tell, I can't go into what it is. But stuff is weird in my house right now. And we have an extra resident who is very unhealthy, yeah. unexpectedly. So... Like, I don't think about the future. I don't plan very well. But, you know, I'm making an exception for Isabel because I'm going, we, she's going to move back here. Yeah. She, she doesn't have a choice. <laughs> That's fine with me. Well, you know, there's a couple of things that, based on what you just said, that I think relates well to friendship in, in some ways. And one is, you know, despite, I mean, it's horrible to think about why you might not think about the future, right? You know, that's horrible. But one of the things that maybe can come from it is living in the present and knowing if there is a lifespan. And it's so funny that you mentioned that because my advisor at Penn State University is a lifespan person. <laughs> that's what he studied. So, it, but there is that lifespan. There is a span for something that, you know, makes us, you know, we're always looking in the future or we're always looking to the next thing. And why not focus on where we are, what we're doing and who our friends are now. And one of the things that I regret the most is the last time I saw my friend Allison before she was killed in a car accident, that I didn't tell her how much I loved her, that she was my best friend. I've known her since first grade and she was just an absolute ray of sunshine. And one of the things now, having had that experience, I always tell people, how I feel about them, because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen the next day. I don't know what's going to happen later today. But I can tell you right now that you mean the world to me, right? That this is, I care about you. I love you. You're my friend. And I think that is something that's important that we focus on how we feel about people now. But I also like this sort of secret vibe you got by putting it out there in the world that she is coming back to Boston. <laughs> and so <laughs> that there is that hope though too, you know, and that you would make an exception that it sounds like Isabel is your person, right? That we might not make exceptions for everyone, but she is that person for you. No, I, I think absolutely. I think that I can't, I still, you know, now after two years, I can't convince her <laughs> that she is worth it and, and she is that important to me, you know, because she's just so sure that she's not disposable. That's not the word I want to use. I know what you mean. But, you know, it, it's she that people are going to be OK with her being gone because I think that's a military thing. Yeah. And on top of that, she's French, yeah. you know, so she's sort of already stranger in a strange land. She's not yeah. around people that have known her forever. Yeah. She doesn't have that connection. And then on top of it. She can't form permanent connections here because she's going to be moving in a couple of years. And she knows that all the time. And so given that, sort of regardless of self-esteem, we've already got several things against us in terms of me convincing her like, no, no, <laughs> no, you're my person. Like you, you matter that much. You are worth it. And so, OK, so we're trying right now. I'm trying to convince her to give me a, a sleepover before she leaves because <laughs> it's been since Ryan Beck that we were able to do it. And so I'm saying, you know, there's a weekend in June that neither of us has anything going on. So let's get a and b nearby. My husband will take her kids. He's done it before. Yeah. And we will go and just have, you know, 24 hours. Yeah. You know, it's just us before she moves. And she's like, oh, you know, this, oh, that, oh, that, you know, I'm not going to want to this. I'm not going to want to that. And she's kind of pointing out all of the problems about her that I, I, you know, as though I don't, first of all, as though I don't know them. Secondly, as though I give a shit, <laughs> you know, and it, like thirdly, as though somehow that's going to tell, like, she's going to say something and I'm going to be like, oh, you're right. You know what? I don't want that, you know, in some way. And I'm like, you know what? There is pretty much nothing you can say that's going to make me go, Right. Okay. Yeah. You're right. I don't want that. You know, so like she can say no. She has every right to say no. And that's that also is not going to change 
my feelings and thoughts about her. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, I still am going to adore her, but I want that because I'm selfish. I want that time with her. <laughs> like I want, even if it all it means is that I get another hour with her. Yeah. You know, I want it because I know I'm not going to have it. And so I kind of have to store up. Yeah. And just, I want to have one more thing in the memory banks because as much, you know, I agree with you and I don't know if Isabel is used to saying, I love you yeah. on a regular basis, but I say it on a routine basis, like every time she leaves and every time, because life is short and I want at least to know that my last words were not like, you know, dude, pull up your pants, <laughs> whatever. I don't, I don't know what people say, <laughs> but, you know, I want something that's not like, oh, you got something on your face, you know, see so, yeah. I, I, I want to know that for myself yeah. uh, because you never know. But also, I want to know that I spent every moment I could with her, yeah. you know, rather than, oh, blow it off. I'm tired today. You know, I don't know how to word it exactly. But there's that thing of like, yeah, if, if someone's your person, I think you know it. You just do. Yeah. And over time, certainly she's trusted me more, like, to talk to me about things that I don't think you can talk to with the mommy friends. Yeah. You know, the, the people that you stand with at a birthday party or you drop your kids off at school at the same time and now you're expected to be best friends just because you had sex in the same year. <laughs> Those people. And, <laughs> you know, so there's that. And so far, you know, she's told me some pretty intense things. And at no point have I ever been like either, OK, I'm going to back away now or what the hell is your problem? Yeah. I mean, that's part of it. It's sort of the fundamentals of why I started a podcast in the first place is that there are so many things about the world that other people say, like, isn't that awful? Isn't that bizarre? Isn't that weird? And I'm like, no, <laughs> listen, I have worked in places that you can't even imagine exist in terms of locked psych wards and prisons mm -hmm. and stuff. So and I'm not comparing our friendship to that. Don't worry. Really, <laughs> I'm starting really. to get worried. <laughs> It's like a prison. <laughs> I've seen the bad stuff. And so the fact that you're not locked up means, I, you know, bring it. There's nothing you can say. You know, and like it all makes, it's not just that I can handle it, but that it makes sense to me. Yeah. You know, and so if she talks about like a day where she's feeling anxious about something, you know, that's coming up. I think part of anxiety is not just that you are feeling anxious, but that your brain is going, what the hell is your problem? You shouldn't feel anxious about this. You should get over this. Everybody else is blah, blah, blah. You're shooting all over yourself, right? Yeah. And I can kind of just talk to her and remind her, like, this is not weird. Yeah. Other people go through this. You're normal in a hang out with me sense, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But I hope that that's, I don't know, not a comfort. That's not the word I'm looking for. But, do you know, talk for me for a while because I sound like an idiot. Go. No, I agree with you. I mean, I remember that one time when we talked about how I felt I was a bad mother for, you know, whatever reasons. Because everybody it, does. Everybody, yeah. all of us feels like we're bad yeah. mothers. And you managed to show me and prove to me that how I felt was normal, but that I was not a bad mother yeah. for the things I was talking about, that it was absolutely normal. And even though I probably knew that already, I didn't really believe it, but you made me believe it. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. And me over here who loves friendship is like, that's what friends are for. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that makes me wonder, uh, so this is a question that I ask people who I interview on the show, and that is, uh, what has it meant to be friends with each other? So, Isabel, what has it meant to be friends with Kate? And Kate, what has it meant to you to be friends with Isabel? People who I interview on the show. And that is, uh, what has it meant to be friends with each other? So, Isabel, what has it meant to be friends with Kate? And Kate, what has it meant to you to be friends with Isabel? Um, how do I describe this? I take it for granted. Yeah, I don't think about it in that. I mean, I think at least partly, like I said, I don't hang out with very many people. And among those, I'm used to getting psychologist -y, even though I don't mean to. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's kind of putting that on, putting on that role of, of talking somebody down or whatever. And I don't show my own meltdowns very easily. Mm-hmm. But Isabel's seen it. She's she's watched me, you know, melt down and end up having to stay over. Yeah. Or just be sick in some way or another and be able to show that. And the next time we get together, I don't have to explain, well, this is what happened. Or I don't have that sense of, I mean, because I've been dropped 
Yeah. Dropped. You know, a, a 10 year friendship ended at a blink of an eye because I was sick. And I think because also I tried to be a good friend and step up and, you know, see somebody through a hard period in, in their life and they ended up feeling like I had seen too much. I think that was kind of the issue. Yeah. Um, but I, I had a friendship that I relied on hardcore disappear. And it took me, you know, six years before I could even consider leaning on somebody. I don't lean. Yeah. You know, other than on my husband, I don't lean. And so being able to lean, being able to let Isabel see just how fucked up I am, mm -hmm. that's a big deal. You know, not having to be the strong one it is a big deal. It, you know, I'm not vulnerable easily. Yeah. Yeah. And what about you, Isabel? Um, it's just been so uh, such a comfort, you know, every time I, I spent with Kate. I just feel like I can be myself and, you know, I can tell her about everything and she uh, she responds, you know, she just, I, I, it's such a hard thing to say. <laughs> I, and you're right, I, we take it for granted. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's true, you know. Um, but, um, yeah, it's been a comfort and just fun and... I, I don't know how to explain it. I'm sorry. No, it's... Well, I think, too, there's something to be said for the fact that Isabel and I knew each other before she moved mm -hmm. here. Do you know what I mean? Like, she didn't have to go through the awkward, stilted introduction phase yeah. of friendship because we already knew each other. We already both knew each other and at least were friendish. <laughs> and so we were kind of able to skip through a lot of that and go very quickly into... So let me bitch about this. You know, let me float this or let me let me let me tell you about that and start, you know, sort of feeling the other person out of like, do you still like me when I say that? <laughs> do you still put up with me when I do this and and see it? You know, you know what I mean? Like it just was able to progress quickly. Yeah. You're testing the waters. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> well, I mean, listening to and being witness to your friendship, I mean, I, I think that Anyone who listens to the podcast knows I sort of geek out over friendship and it means so much to me and it just means a lot that other people would talk to me and let me witness their friendship as well. And I really appreciate how open and candid you've been about so many different topics that we've talked about. And I wonder if there was anything else that you wanted to share about your friendship Anything that we haven't discussed or something, a story of the, about the two of you that you wanted to share, you know, Kate and Isabel's story, you know, whatever it might be. I wanted to give you some space to talk. She, <laughs> to, she, to Rhinebeck, we're driving out and <laughs> she knows where I'm going with this. <laughs> so, we're, now, I am hard of hearing, and that's an important, important part of this story, is that I, I'm hard of hearing, and I have been, and, you know, I, I read lips and very dependent on, uh, on that, and I can figure out what you've said mm -hmm. if I can't see your face, but it takes me a minute usually. So we're driving out and just sort of talking about, you know, what did you pack or what are you going to do or whatever, and I heard her say that, among other things, for breakfast the next morning, she had brought her French breasts. <laughs> and I was kind of confused about what that meant for breakfast, but I was also <laughs> intrigued, you know, more than anything. And, it, you know, it turns out that she had brought her French press <laughs> coffee. I thought it was going to be French bread, so... Uh. <laughs> no, 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 French breasts, for sure. And so <laughs> so that night, we're hanging out with, our, uh, you know, among our friends. There was one woman she had never met. There's another who was also from that iVillage board that, that we met on. And my sister was there. And so, uh, which you had not met Sarah, right? You didn't no, know I her at all. Her. So, so Isabel's with two total strangers, mm -hmm. um... One friend she now knew in person and one friend she'd known online. And as you may have picked up, Isabel tends to be fairly shy and retiring, yeah. right? And so I had no idea how she was going to cope with me telling this joke in person, but I didn't care because I'd had a couple of glasses of wine and I never drink. 
ever. <laughs> and so my sister starts taking photos, like of the four of us who sort of knew each other from online. And so my sister is, is nine years younger than me, which makes her infinitely cooler than I am. <laughs> and so like I'm used to lining people up and going, say hi, because the word hi makes a more natural smile than cheese. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I got that's unusual in front of a camera, right? And she, well, I, I didn't even know. She was like, scream, act like bees are after you, you know, <laughs> and then act like velociraptors. I don't even know. She had like this series of things that she said, <laughs> which made it just funnier. So we're laughing at her and she got some good photos out of that. And then I said, all right, show off your French breasts. <laughs> and I'm expecting Isabel to probably either kill me on the spot or just stand there and giggle at me or whatever. And I have a photo of her arching her back in the best, <laughs> most prow of a ship way. And she just rolled with it, you know, and that was, well, that's the moment, you know, where, you know, by this point I've known her for about six months and that's the moment where I'm like, you're my person. Like, We're good. Because <laughs> she can be as shy breath. as she wants, but she can sort of rise to the occasion as it were. <laughs> needed so that that photo i mean in that photo, it's not risky it's not risque in any way yeah. the other the other women all did it too yeah <laughs> you know and so in the photo you can't tell where this comes from you just see a bunch of women standing loud and proud you know what i mean <laughs> but uh that was a, a fabulous moment i feel yeah. like in some way <laughs> the name fun, of this yeah. episode should be show me your french breasts but <laughs> i'm fine with that bring it are you okay with that i don't even i'm care. okay with it <laughs> see <laughs> And people will be like, what is this about? We'll listen to the whole episode and find out about their friendship. Your, yeah, your downloads are going to spike. <laughs> I'll be like, what is this? I have to find out if iTunes allows the word breast. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can tell from our chat that the topics moved organically, and I wanted to protect this authenticity of the conversation by not editing anything out. I wanted to do this for two reasons. One, I wanted to provide a complete interview as another deposit to the memory bank of Kate and Isabel's friendship as they navigate the changes to their friendship due to Isabel's move. And honestly, I think you get these really great moments of Isabel's laughter in response to Kate and then working out speaking time and building off each other that showcases a friendship that is simply two people together sharing, talking, and laughing, and as Kate put it, knitting and ignoring our kids. <laughs> but also, the second reason I didn't want to cut anything out is because I think the topics that came up during our chat, even if it was not directly relevant to their friendship, are directly critical to all of us with friends. Friendship already operates as a second-class relationship in our society with little attention highlighted, although I will concede and say that there have been changes and there are some things that do get more attention than others, but it's simply, it's not on the same playing field as romantic relationships. And it's the conversations about problems in a relationship that are supposed to be voluntary and fun that are even fewer and far between than the conversations simply about friendship and all the good stuff. And like with Kate's podcast, she talks about why things happen. She wants to answer that question. And I'm the same way. Um, you know, so her working in forensic psychology, I'm a communication person. I think there is this level of wanting to know the answer to why, why people do and say the things they do. Why do some friends stick around during crises and others do not? Why can we more easily discuss romantic breakups than friendship breakups? Why do we assume friendships are forever, even in my title, Best Forevers, when everything has an expiration date? So in a lot of ways, I see this conversation with Isabel and Kate as a love letter to a pretty amazing friendship, but also a charge for us to do better in understanding friendships. This is what I want to do. I would like to hear from you, my dear listeners and friends. What questions do you have about friendships? What problems have you experienced in friendships have been the most difficult for you to cope with? What did you say during these issues? How did you handle them? What were your strategies? It seems like a theme in the podcast is that we simply do not have scripts for things about friendship, especially when it is something that can be negative or problematic. And so I'd like to tackle this head on with your help and some help of my friends in future episodes. So send me your questions, stories, and scripts, and we'll get to work on this stat. And I think it is Isabel and Kate's friendship and our conversation that has inspired me even more to get to the heart of this. This is something I talk about a lot on my podcast, but it's time to stop talking and time to start doing. But even more, as I re-listen to this episode, I feel like I am reminded at 
the strength and the power of friendship and knowing that someone like Isabel who enjoyed Kate's company or, or knew her online but was there through a very difficult time in her life and that as someone who has difficulty making friends because of military moves, this idea of not wanting to get attached but knowing that right away that Kate was her person, that it was something that she just knew right away, that she enjoyed being with her and felt comfortable and could be herself. And I also love that Kate talks about not wanting to lean in, but it is with Isabel that she does lean on, that Isabel is the one that makes her get up and put pants on. And isn't that what friends are about? Friends are there for us when we're having difficulty. They're the ones that remind us that it is normal to think that we are bad mothers, but truly we're not bad mothers, that they're the ones that convince us of this. They're the ones that remind us of all the wonderful things that we're doing as mothers or as humans or as women, as people, whatever the case may be. Friends are the ones that are saying, you know what, you've been sitting on the couch long enough. It's time to get up, get out in the sun, enjoy the time. Let's be together in the present because we never know how long we'll be together. We don't know what's going to happen today. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But right now, we are the best of friends. You are my person, and I love you. And again, as I talked about in the chat with Isabel and Kate, that is something I wish I would have said to my friend Allison. So this episode has meant a lot to me in a lot of different ways. I am reminded not to take our friendships for granted. And even though I'm out here celebrating friendship and wanting us to bring friendship to the forefront, it's a good reminder for me as well is that we don't want to take any of our friends for granted and that we always want to let our friends know how we feel about them. But even more, I believe this episode has fueled a fire that's already been burning inside me to do a little bit more. And I think that is something that when you listen to Kate's podcast, you kind of get that feeling like, oh, let's do this thing. You know, I just, you know, uh, it's just very inspiring, right? And so that's what I took away from this episode. And, and I would love to hear what you took away from this episode, as well as what you have to say about getting at the heart of bringing not only friendship to the forefront, but problems that friendships experience or not knowing how to cope with different things. How can we be better friends? How can we be more compassionate friends, as I talked about with Heidi Bennett in a previous episode? So thank you for listening to Best Forevers, a podcast for kindred spirits. I'm so grateful for all the friends I've made since starting the podcast, all the support received, and for every single listen. Be sure to check out Best Forevers on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Best Forevers Pod. And please share your friendship stories by checking out bestforeverspod.com forward slash surveys or by emailing me at bestforeverspod at gmail.com. Now, I indicated I would love to hear about the questions that you have because I like to help answer those questions. I like to hear about some of the problems that have been the most difficult for you so we can have episodes dedicated to that, getting other people on here to work through those issues, getting some academic research, getting people's experience, getting all this out here so that we can talk about it frankly and openly like we should. But additionally, I love to hear stories about people who are friends um, in the military. I am not as familiar with the military culture, and I think that there is something to be said about friendship within that culture, and I would love to hear your stories. I would also love to hear stories about friendship trips. Uh, Isabel and Kate talked about one that they took to the, the fair. Was it a fair? The sheep and wool. I don't remember the exact wording, but they had their friendship trip, and I just had my friendship trip with Tara. So if you have any travel experiences, I'd like to hear about that. And if you go on bestforeverspod.com forward slash surveys, there are a bunch of different topics that you can respond to, or you can write your story uniquely or separately. Um, write to me and bestforeverspod at gmail.com. If you love friendship as much as I do, you may consider supporting the movement to love on our friends more and the podcast on patreon.com forward slash best forevers pod. There's lots of cool perks and goals, so check it out. I would love to call you friends with benefits. And one of the things I'm very excited about is one of my Patreon goals is to raise enough money to get a bench and a wood burning pen where I can write all of your names and your friends' names on it. And once that it's filled with names to be able to donate that buddy bench to a local school or to a school that really needs a space for people to come together to understand each other because making friends is hard as hell. And that is something that Isabel talked about here too. So if that is something you're interested in, then please go to my Patreon and check that out. 
I also have some cool new stickers coming in um, with Ferguson, my producer, on them, and they're to die for. Kate Cosgrove, my bestie, is amazing and <laughs> looks exactly like Ferguson. So um, if you like those new stickers, also go to Patreon and check it out. The last thing I'll say to check out is Kate's podcast, Ignorance Was Bliss. It is a true crime podcast that focuses on the why and the idea that the difference between people, you know, people who experience these traumas, crises, or crime, and me might just be who has access to the key. And I think that Kate's ability to talk about these topics in a thoughtful, compassionate, very frank and open way um, makes this podcast especially special. So it's definitely something you want to check out and after you can hear the promo. So folks, we need to lean on our friends and we need to figure out how we can work through problems with our friends because without our friends, who would we be? That's horrible. It's true. So strange. Usually. I can't imagine what that's like. Do you want to? That could never happen to me. It might. Lock him away. He's pure evil. Or insane. Or human. My name's Kate. I have worked as a forensic psychologist, as well as in prisons and as a crisis clinician. My job was to figure out who gets locked up and who gets a key to find the humanity in inhumane situations. So, are you sure you really want to know? Yeah, maybe. Because by the end of the episodes, you just might end up thinking... I felt better before I knew that. You can find me at IWB Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, sometimes Instagram, or you can email me at iwbpodcast at gmail.com.